Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Um, spend some time uh, very briefly talking to you about some key aspects of how we've built the Google Cloud to address some of the challenges that uh, Jeff and the previous speakers this morning have been uh, talking about. Uh, first, before I get into that, what I'd like to do is uh, just run through a, uh, a quick um, scenario. This is a scenario that I'm sure very many of you are very familiar with. Um, it's, it's actually a scenario around remote meetings where, for one business reason or another, preparing a customer meeting, for instance, you have the need to interconnect somebody at the office, somebody at home, and somebody in a coffee shop waiting to go out to meet your customer. Um, because they're in different environments, they clearly they have different tools available to them. Um, in the conference room, um, you have a fine video conferencing system. Um, at home, the worker has their laptop, has available to them on the laptop a video conferencing application. They have a remote meeting application, so ability to interact both verbally and via documents. Um, for the person who's in the coffee shop, a little bit different. You're there in an environment where everybody can hear what you're saying, so they don't want to be participating um, over the video conference. So they've got their telephone, so they can uh, participate by voice. But um, they have to see the documents. They have to be part of the, uh, the creation and the collaboration to prepare for the meeting. So very different endpoints, very different applications needed by the different, um, different participants. We've all built applications of this kind uh, before, and it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of money. Um, you buy the servers, you install, you have to maintain the servers. You buy the software, you have to integrate the software, especially where there are different applications involved. Um, and you have to, of course, integrate it into whatever the security um, systems you use uh, within the enterprise are. So it's very complex, very, um, very expensive for the enterprise. Um, but then, let's not forget the poor, the poor user, the end client, they have the application on their laptops, be it at home or in the coffee shop. They have to download the applications, they have to make sure they have the right plugins or uh, <coughs> drivers, make sure they're configured. Then they can um, access the applications, they typically will have to enter different applications in different ways, enter different credentials. Not very, not very friendly. And of course, you're a successful business. As you grow the business, you just have to add more and more of this. So it gets more complex. You start to having to um, put the band-aid together to actually uh, be able to maintain the system as you've, uh, as you've built it. The old word. So with the cloud, um, it's very different. The cloud is always on. The cloud is always connected. Data in the cloud is always being updated. The applications and the data are in the cloud. So since we deliver, the applications through the browser. As long as you have a device that has a browser, be it a laptop, a desktop, a, a smartphone, you can access those applications. Very much straight, more straightforward for the end user, nothing to download. For the enterprise, you don't have to invest in that infrastructure. But that's really, um, as um, a couple of speakers today have already pointed out, just really the beginning. One of the key drivers and key aspects for us uh, from an engineering perspective that uh, we appreciate so much about the cloud is that it allows us to innovate in a continuous fashion. The rate at which we can create new features for products, create new products, roll them out, and develop, grow the feature set of our applications is, is outstanding. Um, as Jeff just said, we look at rolling out new features roughly on about an every two week um, basis. Some of them are big, some of them are smaller. It's a continuous innovation that allows us to keep closer and closer to the needs of our, of our users. In addition to that, with the power you have inside the cloud, the computing power in the cloud, we have the ability to create new types of uh, feature and functionality. Um, as Dave was talking about, the ability to have translation so that we can translate documents um, and have people with different language backgrounds be able to share the, the, the work product of collaboration. Um, as we start to get the combination of speech to text and then machine translation, the ability to have more real-time communication being, again, performed between people with different language backgrounds. And then just intelligent processing, the ability to um, look at that pile of, uh, pile of email that Jeff was talking about, determine what's important for the end user and show that at a different, um, different level in their mail inbox to help them become more productive. These things are only possible within the cloud. So, Google's cloud. I'm going to talk about four key aspects of the cloud here. Clearly, it's a huge subject, and I can, spend, I can, I can speak for a long, long time um, on what it takes to build the cloud. But today, I'm going to talk about scale, 
reliability, extensibility, and security. First of all, scale. We have a big cloud. It's a big, big cloud. Our data centers are big. The um, picture here, this is a Google Earth picture of, um, it's actually early in the building of one of our data centers in North America, where um, excavations were still underway. But you see sort of three big areas there. They are all the locations where the data center buildings for that uh, data center were going to be um, constructed. And just to give you a feeling of scale there, that red rectangle is the size of a regulation football pitch. Okay? So you multiply that by the overall, um, overall size, size of the, those excavations, you see just the magnitude of the size of the, uh, the data centers that we're talking about. <coughs> Across the data centers, hundreds of thousands of servers. We have dozens of data centers. We have the world's third largest IP network interconnecting these so that they are always on. <coughs> but that's just the numbers. And building a cloud, building scalability, isn't just about those numbers. It isn't just about having the largest racks and the biggest sets of um, systems within the racks. It's how you build a living system. Okay. So what we've done is, and this is taking innovation from the ground up, from the hardware side and from the software side, is build a cloud that really is a living computing environment. This allows us to add new capacity. When capacity is needed, it may be a new application is being, um, being released. It may be um, a new feature associated with search is being, uh, being released. We can add capacity where it's needed. If we see a spike in users, again, we can add capacity. Clearly, one of the areas where this also plays in is into the next topic, which is around reliability. Again, it's great to have this, this, this huge great computing environment, but if it isn't fundamentally reliable, then again, the value that we're providing is highly diminished. So we've placed our data centers in select countries, in select um, areas of countries, in order to protect the service that we provide. So that if there's an issue associated with the area of one data center, we can fail over to another data center and the service is not impacted for the end user. One of the fundamental aspects of building the cloud, especially with the number of, uh, number of servers that uh, we have in our data centers, is that you'll have failures. Okay? Servers will fail. And so, fundamentally, at the hardware and software level, we have acknowledged that fact and built a system that will then heal and recognize failures and heal. What that means more practically is that we have uh, redundant copies of applications, redundant copies of, of data, so that if a failure does occur, then there is a natural failing over, potentially within the same data center, potentially within a different data center, in order to keep the service maintained for the, uh, for the end user. And that de depends heavily upon a very high speed form of replication, which means if that failover does take place, then the data that's available to the user after that failover has taken place is the live set of data for them. Okay, so there's no lag between waiting for the data to, uh, to be available for them. It's there. Now, clearly, one aspect of reliability is that you know, issues do occur. There are failures. There are bugs that occur. And one of the aspects of reliability that is very, very um, important to us um, is transparency about this. Uh, clearly, we have monitoring in place, we, have, uh, we recognize when failures take place, and we will um, initiate um, mitigation uh, pr procedures to actually try and address the issues that occur. But what we want to be is transparent about these failures. And so we've implemented a status dashboard so that our apps users can actually see if we see an error with one of our products, with one of our apps. They can understand, we get a feeling for you know, what, the, uh, what the impact of the um, issue is, get an estimate of what the resolution time for that issue is. And so they can hopefully work with that and then um, you know, we will uh, do our very best to actually meet the, uh, meet the expectations that we set within it. But it's critical that we set that, um, we're, we're transparent and we're able to provide that information to our, to our clients. Extensibility. This is, this is a topic that um, is, is really, really key to us. Um, and this is really our recognition that you know, we have a world-class set of applications around messaging, around uh, collaboration, around uh, interpersonal communication. But clearly, the enterprise needs more. Um, you all have budgeting systems, HR systems, back office systems. And these should not exist in silos, in, in separate worlds. 
And so as we've built the, uh, the, the Google Cloud, uh, what we've done is we've built interfaces um, and ways of accessing data, sharing data in, in actually many different ways. One key way is being able to allow data to be shared between the enterprise on-premise systems and, um, and our cloud so that you can have integrated sets of data into our applications, such as from a uh, CRM system into our email system. A second is um, the app engine that Jeff mentioned. This is um, a, um, a opportunity, if you like, for developers, be it enterprise custom developers, be it third-party software developers, to really exploit what we've built in terms of the, uh, the infrastructure I talked about. There's hundreds of thousands of servers and the, the self-healing, healthy, um, intelligent uh, cloud. And then the marketplace, which takes that uh, a step further in many ways and provides APIs which allow software developers to build applications that integrate into um, our data, integrate into our administration um, capabilities on the apps platform, so that when the end user, you, the, uh, the enterprise, purchases an application from one of those other vendors and they have to administer it, the objects are the same, the people are the same, they can use the same view of the organization to administer the Google application plus that third party application. And clearly the market pro uh, marketplace provides a place for the software developers to come together to list their applications and then for um, you, the enterprise customers, to select the specific applications that meet the business requirements that, that, you, that you have. And so this is a very fundamental step in really growing the ecosystem for the cloud-based applications. Then the final point here um, is um, you know, not a trivial point at all. Um, it's about data exchange into and out of uh, the, the Google Cloud. Um, clearly, you know, we provide um, some, actually some very, very um, strong tools to help migrate your old data, your, your data from your old systems into the Google Cloud so that your users can be up and running very quickly. But very importantly, you know, we recognize that you know, if you try it, it may be for one reason or another you decide the cloud isn't for you. And so we also provide um, APIs, methods to allow you to take your data out of the Google Cloud and migrate it to some other solution. So really being open, um, preventing any form of, of lock-in with this approach. Then moving on to security. Security, again, is just, I can't emphasize how important um, security is to us um, and sort of the comprehensive view that we take of security as we try to very, very clearly meet um, our requirement to protect our users and, and their data. Um, again, security is one of these things that we look at at different, different levels. There's the, the, the technology level, the software level. Um, what I've got depicted here is um, a representation of one of the ways that we protect user data. Okay. So we don't store user data in, a, in its entirety um, on, on disk. What we do is we take that user data, we chop it up into small pieces. We then encode each of those small pieces, and then we store them on different disks. Okay. So this clearly impacts the threat model associated with people trying to access user data, in that in order to get to that data, you have to know which disks it's on, you have to understand the way that it was encoded and the specific keys for encoding it, and you need to know how it should be reassembled in order to get it. Very, very different um, attack uh, vector you need to, uh, to, to achieve success in that. So this is just you know, one example of um, how security is reflected at different levels of our, of our architecture. But more importantly, or I should not say more importantly, but in addition to um, the technology, it's also about um, some key, uh, key aspects. It's about our policies, it's about tools, procedures, and people. It's about the security policies we put in place that define what levels of access different uh, members of the Google team have to what types of data, how we need to look after and protect that data. It's about the tools we use to recognize and detect vulnerabilities and attacks and then clearly to, to deal with those. It's about the procedures that the people who are working with our systems go through, again, to protect the systems and protect access to those systems. And then very, very importantly, it's about the people themselves. The people who are designing the software, building the software, so the software engineers who are all um, taught, coached on how to build software that is secure. It's about the people who um, actually run the systems, administer the systems, administer the systems, run through the policies. And then it's about the team of, of security experts who actually define 
how we should be looking at soft, uh, security, whether it's in the software, whether it's in the, uh, the, the way we uh, look at our data centers, whether it's in our communications, all aspects of that, um, of, of the building of the, uh, the overall cloud. And we built actually a very substantial organization of some of the world's former security experts to, to um, be the team that defines and runs that aspect of, uh, of security. And so you know, we, our investment in this area uh, is such that we feel this is a fundamental need in, to, in order to um, build and maintain trust with our, with, our, with our customers. Now, one of the benefits I talked about around functionality, the features of our application, is, is the ability to innovate continuously and uh, launch new features for our applications. That is just as appropriate and just as applicable to security features as it is to you know, the lo latest with bang feature on Gmail or one of our other applications. And as this slide uh, represents, over the last couple of years, we've actually um, released some very significant features that um, helped secure the way that our applications are accessed. Um, it helps to secure different device types um, and uh, how they access the uh, overall uh, infrastructure. And um, the final bullet on here is something that I'm very excited to actually announce today, which is our new, uh, latest uh, feature on the security side, which is called two-step verification. So, what's the problem that two-step verification is addressing? It's all about passwords. Passwords are known to be one of the key vulnerabilities uh, when it comes to accessing um, applications. They're weak, you know, they're somebody's birthday, their dog, their, their, their address. Very, very simple, very, very weak. Um, if they aren't weak, they may be meeting uh, some of the, the rules that sites, um, sites uh, impose in order to um, have an effective password. There are still very well-known attacks for learning the password of a user, phishing attacks being sort of clearly one of the uh, prevalent ways of, uh, of, of learning people's passwords. Whether the passwords are weak, you know, dog's name, or a very complex um, combination of, of characters, there's still another problem, which is when you look at um, the different sites that people um, have access to, the different um, applications, the frequency of which people use the same credentials, the same default um, user IDs, and the same passwords is really, really um, alarming. Um, it's a natural thing to do, I have to admit, you know, at times um, I've uh, used the same passwords on different, uh, different accounts, um, and uh, one of the risks here is that clearly if you get access to one of those accounts, you have access to a broader set of uh, sites. A few days ago, I, uh, I read, this, uh, read this cartoon. I'll just leave it up um, on the screen there for a couple of minutes for you to read it. But it highlights, highlights the problem I'm talking about. The point here being that it is entirely feasible to put up a fully legitimate website, capture user ID and password credentials, and then from that, use that as an exploit to attack other accounts belonging to those users. There's a very good chance for a large number of those users that user ID and that password will match on those other accounts. That's the problem. Now, there are um, ways of combating this problem, and uh, many of our large customers have actually Im um, implemented a way of, of combating this, which is to use a form of uh, two-factor authentication. The idea there being that you have the password, which is in this case the weak uh, source of information, and then you have some other token, which is, um, which is a secure, um, normally or very often will have a limited lifetime piece of information that you combine in order to gain access to the, uh, to the application. That's great. It actually works to, to um, protect from you know, a large proportion of the, um, of the, of the um, attacks here. Um, again, though, like with the first scenario, you have the, the, the issues of you, know, it's, you have to buy servers, you buy software, it's complex, and um, you have to make sure it's integrated in with your authentication system, so it is a, um, it's quite a burden. This, as a result, we see only our biggest customers who have actually implemented this and integrated in with the single sign-on systems. For the vast majority of companies in the industry, we see that it's just beyond them. As a result, what we'd like to announce today um, is a new feature for Google Apps that we call two-step verification. And this is taking that capability and moving it into the realm of any enterprise, whatever the size is. So the notion again is there are two pieces of information. There is something you know, which is your password, and there is an object. <coughs> the object is used to, uh, to create a token, which is then the challenge for you to actually log on. 
So you have your user ID, you have your password, and then when you log on, you will uh, be challenged for a verification code. That verification code comes from the object, and the object in this case is your mobile phone. We've got two ways of generating that object for you. One is we have built applications for Android, for iPhone, and for BlackBerry, which share a piece of information with, uh, with the cloud and generate a secure key for you to enter into that, into that uh, box. Secondly, it's also um, possible to have a code delivered by SMS if you don't want to um, load an uh, application onto your mobile device. So in that way, you then have this secure uh, piece of information to be able to verify that indeed this is the, um, this is the individual who should be accessing that, uh, that, uh, that application. So this is available from today. Um, it is uh, no additional charge to our, uh, to our enterprise customers. And um, in fact, if you look at the, uh, the, the online stores, you um, can, uh, can actually go and uh, download the application to generate keys right away. Ron, I want to say I'm a marketing guy, right? So I've, I've built a nice slideware before with the screenshots of the product that doesn't quite work. Not for Google, of course, but uh, I've seen it done. Is there a way we can see this thing live and the power of the cloud is all about immediate access to innovation? Can we see this stuff running? That's a great, that's a great idea, Jeff. <laughs> then, 